welcome and thank you for coming to the webinar series from the Ioneer Foundation called Sight and Sound Bites. So this bi-weekly webinar series highlights research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is an interesting one and one we haven't had before. It's uh, nasal obstruction, the deviated septum, everything you wanted to know. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Ioneer Foundation, and the Ioneer Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, cancers of the head and neck at the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide from the Ioneer Foundation support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. And of course, we're always very appreciative of support that, that um, uh, to the foundation and, and you can find ways to make donations through uh, our website or contacting us directly. Housekeeping roles for today's webinar. The chat is disabled on our webinars um, because we use the Q&A function. So when you wanna ask a question, which you can do at any time during the program, you can click on Q&A and type your question. I'll be reading the questions to our speaker today at the end of the presentation. Um, please refrain from personal health questions that the whole audience wouldn't necessarily benefit from, but um, you can always uh, put them in anyway and uh, or send an email to Mr. Craig Smith, whose email uh, sent you the original uh, invitation, and we'll get those, we'll answer those questions for you, have uh, the right person answer the questions for you. Please feel free to use the, su the subtitles function for closed captioning, and uh, we'll re uh, and, and you'll be continue to stay on our mailing list as you are right now for um, future webinars. Um, so let me introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Grant Gilman. Um, we're so excited he's here because it's the first time we've had Dr. Gilman. Dr. Gilman is an associate professor and the director of facial plastics and reconstructive surgery in the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. His clinical research interests, interests concentrate in the combined and related areas of sinonasal and functional nasal airway surgery. Dr. Gilman, welcome. Thank you, and we all look forward to your presentation. Great. Thank you very much, Lonnie. Um, okay. Well, first of all, um, I'm uh, Dr. Grant Gilman. Grant Gilman, thank you very much for your uh, interest and uh, for tuning in to something, to give to give me the chance to talk about something that's near to dear, uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's making people breathe better through their nose. So we're going to talk about the uh, deviated septum and get a little bit beyond that, and um, uh, so uh, we'll we'll get moving a little bit about me. Um, I did my uh, residency in Canada, born and bred, um, uh, and uh, then two fellowships in the United States, one of which was here in uh, Pittsburgh um, in sinonasal uh, surgery, and then the second one in Florida in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery. And I've been a surgeon here uh, full-time at the university since 1998. Um, People ask me what I do, and I say, well, I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, but I don't do ear and I don't do throat. Um, and many of us are subspecialized, and um, uh, certainly I think that my area of expertise, uh, interest, and and what I'm most known for really is um, the nasal side of uh, ear, nose, and throat. So my primary interest, uh, as, as Lonnie had uh, mentioned, is um, uh, in nasal airway obstruction or functional nasal airway surgery which can include the deviated septum, functional septal rhinoplasties, crooked noses, previously operated on noses, about maybe 20 or 25% of the people I've operated on have had prior surgery, um, uh, cosmetic rhinoplasty, sinus surgery, et cetera. So um, I do about uh, 200 of these cases a year, uh, roughly. And so I think conservatively, my experience is probably over 3,000, maybe 4,000 cases so far. Um, why should we talk about it? Uh, we should talk about it because nasal airway obstruction is by far one of the most common complaints that presents to a general ENT surgeon or the allergist or a sinus specialist or facial plastic surgeons. And if we think of just septoplasty, <clears throat> behind only tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and, tube, and putting tubes in ears, it's the third most commonly performed surgical procedure amongst the ENT surgeons. And beyond the ability to breathe through the nose, uh, the nasal airway um, uh, or being able to breathe through your nose has a number of different quality of life associations. 
not in everybody. And some of these are stronger and some of these are a little bit loose. But being able to breathe better through your nose has been shown to improve uh, snoring and sleep disorder breathing, um, tolerance for CPAP and people with sleep apnea, the frequency of recurrent sinusitis, the ability to control allergies, uh, the frequency of nosebleeds, in some people, headaches, um, one sense of smell, um, problems with the ear at times, and even facial pain. And again, some of these are stronger associations and some of these are looser. So what we're going to talk about today um, is possible causes of nasal uh, obstruction, just in, in general terms. Uh, and then we're going to get, start to get a little bit more specific. I'm going to walk you through some uh, nasal anatomy 101. Uh, and then we're going to roll through the frequently asked questions in the basics when it comes to the deviated septum. What does it mean? How do we diagnose it? What are the various treatment options? And if we're talking about surgery, what does that entail? And what can one reasonably expect in terms of outcomes? The most commonly encountered reasons for which somebody might be obstructed or feel blocked in their nose are the ones that I've listed there, the most common ones. Inflammatory problems like allergy, for example, infection like sinusitis, any kind of growth in the nose, and we see them. The most common benign growth that people are familiar with are things like nasal polyps or enlarged adenoids. There's a lot of different benign growths in the nose, and there's malignancies in the nose, certainly. And lastly, the structural problems. In other words, how it's built can affect how we breathe through the nose, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So when it comes to the nose, there's the external nose and the internal nose, and both of those can affect how well we breathe through the nose. On the outside, the nose is made up of bones and cartilage. And on the inside or in the nasal cavity, for the most part, as it relates to our topic today, we're thinking about the nasal septum and what are called turbinates. And I'll fill you in a little bit more on those. As far as the external nasal anatomy is concerned, the upper third of the nose is made of the nasal bones. The middle third of the nose and the lower third of the nose are largely sort of made up of uh, cartilage which is a little bit more flexible, a little bit more pliable, so our noses feel softer in that area. And that's what provides support to the lower two-thirds of the nose. To look at it differently, if you think of the nose as a tent, you need space on the inside of the tent, but you also need a framework or walls to that tent that are well-supported and not collapsing, or those two can compromise the amount of space on the inside. So the cartilage that supports the external nose that we were just looking at a minute ago from this view is what supports the external nose and makes up that framework. If it's shaped like this, that's strong, normal, and all well positioned. If it's shaped like this, where there's some collapse either at rest or with breathing, with the effort of breathing, then there's a nasal airway problem and people can't breathe through the nose and the abnormal setup on the outside. Here's a few examples of where the patients that I've looked after, where the outside of the nose clearly is playing some role in how well they do or don't breathe through the inside in addition to the position of their septum. A nose like this, where there's a big shift in the framework externally. A nose like this that is somewhat hourglass in shape where it's pinched through the middle third of the nose. So the cartilage that I talked about through the middle third of the nose there is crimped or pinched or narrowed, it sits a little bit too much towards the center. Or a nose like this, where there's a big curve in the outside framework here, that lower portion reflects what's going on with the septum underneath it. And you can see that there's this concavity where the cartilage that supports that middle third of the nose is, again, collapsed down towards the middle. And here's a couple of other examples of the where the outside of the nose might contribute over and above the position of the septum. A situation like this, where again, from the base view, the nose is pinched. So instead of these side walls looking nice and flat like these ones, they're naturally collapsed. This is not trauma, never had an operation, just born that way. And on top of that, the septum right here is shifted into this left nostril. But then you can have situations like this, where the nose looks really good at rest and with nice normal breathing. But as soon as there's much effort, what we see is the sidewall of the nose, really on both sides, more dramatically on this patient's right than on their left, collapses in towards the middle. 
So it's a structure that looks good and is stable at rest, but isn't strong enough to provide adequate support. So the walls of the tent, to go back to my analogy, are sagging in or being drawn in and compromising the space on the inside. If we turn, turn to the inside of the nose, the nose on the inside, for the most part, again, is um, comprised of the nasal septum, which should be the structure that divides your nose down the middle, divides the two sides of the nose down the middle. And normal structures that sit next to the septum called turbinates that sit on either side of the septum. And again, these are normal structures, but they're more variable in terms of their size, and they're more likely to fluctuate in size, both normally and even more so with upper respiratory infections, with a cold, uh, with allergy symptoms that'll stimulate these turbinates to get larger and larger over time. And we breathe in the space between the septum and the turbinates. So as the tur if the septum is shifted or the turbinates are large, that space is going away. It's being compromised. This is the side view of the nasal septum. So the first thing that you uh, that I want to point out is that the uh, septum actually runs from the tip of the nose to the back of the throat. It makes it about three and a half or four inches long. Most people think of the nose that they breathe through as being just this thing out in front. But the truth is that even as you get beyond the plane of the face, the septum continues all the way back to the back of the throat. So about three and a half or four inches long. In other words, not just what we see on the outside and much longer than we, than most of us imagined. And it's made up of bone, which is typically in the back and low down and cartilage, which is in the front. And the relative amounts of bone and cartilage can differ from one person to the next. And you can have shifts or deviations of the septum uh, in the bone or in the cartilage or in both for that matter. And it comes in all flavors. Um, so on the inside of the nose, if we think about that and how well we breathe, uh, if the septum is shifted over to one side, as shown in this schematic, then we're not going to be able to breathe very well on that side of the nose. Um, or if the turbinates are larger, as shown in this schematic, as compared to the normal here, then we're going to have trouble breathing through the nose. And in many people, um, as the septum shifts to one side, the turbinates on the more open side over time increase in size because there's room for them to get bigger or expand. And so for many people, surgery on the inside of the nose involves addressing the septum and the turbinates at the same time. So let's talk about some frequently asked questions. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, the partition, it means a deviated septum means, the DNS deviated septum means that the partition that, so, that separates the two sides of the nose on the inside is shifted to one side or another. Um, and as a result, the breathing on one side of the nose might feel more restricted or more blocked than that of the opposite side. What causes it? Uh, I see people all the time that they might have a badly deviated septum and say, well, I never broke my nose. Well, it's about a 50-50 split. Um, uh, some of them are clearly related to a history of nasal trauma or some kind of an injury. Uh, and probably the other half are developmental, it just came that way. or Perhaps based on you know, what, what it seemed like very minor or routine, uneventful or incidental childhood drama, who didn't get hit in the ball by a nose at some time as a kid, that might have seemed like nothing at the time, but already started to drive the septum to one side. And you know, children aren't likely to um, articulate those uh, issues or concerns uh, um, as much as adults might. So certainly it can be related to unrecognized pediatric trauma. Can I have one and not know it? Absolutely. Uh, for many people with a milder shift of the septum, it might not bother them in any way. It's ironic, but we see people who are off a little bit and very symptomatic. We see people who are off a little bit and have wouldn't know that they had one if you didn't tell them. We see people where the septum is severely deviated and can't breathe at all. And we see others that are pretty severely deviated and you go, do you breathe okay through your nose? And they are like, yeah, why? Um, so there isn't necessarily a linear relationship between the extent of shift and how well we do or don't breathe through the nose. Some people just seem to tolerate it um, well and some people not so well. Um, is it common? Very common. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, nasal obstruction itself is one of the commonest presenting concerns to ear, nose, and throat surgeons. And based on studies which have been done of, of cadaver skulls, the research has shown uh, that probably two out of three people have a deviated septum to some degree. So very common. Is everybody symptomatic? No, but very common problem. I talked earlier about the fact that the septum might shift to one side and making that side feel more restricted than the other, but can affect both sides of my nose? Absolutely. Uh, the septum can shift in either direction and sometimes both. Sometimes we see the shift, septum shifting in one way towards the front of the nose and swerving back you know, in the opposite direction, further back in the nose. So as I mentioned earlier, they come in a lot of flavors. It can be a shift to one side. It can be a bi-directional shift or a shift that affects both sides. They can be curved. They can be tilted. They can be angled. They can be telescoped. It comes in a lot of different variations. But when we see both sides of the nose being affected, we should always think about whether there's other things that might be going on inside the nose. Uh, is it serious? No. Not in any way. And do I have to have an operation? No, it's not a life-threatening problem, but certainly a balanced nasal airway can have significant implications in terms of quality of life. So it's not a life-threatening problem and it's a, not a life-saving surgery, it's a quality of life surgery. There are advantages to being able to breathe better through the, to being able to breathe through the nose as compared to the mouth. I hear people, I say, well, I don't get enough. I don't breathe through my, I'm a mouth breather. I'm not getting enough oxygen. No, that's not true. Whether you breathe through the nose or breathe through the mouth, both of those take the air that we breathe to our throat and that carries oxygen to our lungs. And our lungs don't care whether the air came through our mouth or whether it came through the nose. So more oxygen, less oxygen to our brain. No, it really doesn't matter whether we're breathing through the nose or breathing through the mouth at that point. However, the nose does do things that the mouth doesn't to the air that we breathe. It filters the air that we breathe. So it treats, it filters our dust and allergens and po uh, pollens, those sort of things. It warms the air that we breathe and bring it to room temperature or to body temperature. Sorry, it makes it more comfortable. And it humidifies the air that we breathe. And furthermore, there's other related conditions, as I alluded to earlier, other things that might benefit from being able to breathe better through the nose. So sleep quality and snoring um, in all patients, no. Uh, yeah, you know, snoring or sleep quality can be affected by many other things in addition to the nose. But certainly the nose is one of the things that contributes to how well we sleep. And we've studied this and looked at it and absolutely find that when people breathe better through their nose, they do feel like their sleep quality subjectively is better. Allergy control. There's lots of people who are desperately taking sprays and antihistamines to try and open up their nose, but when they're structurally blocked on their one side, you can spray it all day long and you can take all the antihistamines you want all day long, but they're not going to move something that's crooked to the middle. So what happens when you straighten out the inside of the nose, oftentimes people feel like their allergies got better. Well, surgery doesn't correct allergies any more than sprays can straighten something that's crooked. But what it does do when you operate on the nose and you give people a more balanced airway is it allows their medications to be better delivered. So if they're using sprays, they're, allowed, they're able to get them back further in the nose now to the target, which therefore makes them more responsive or improves their allergy control. It can benefit people in terms of the frequency of sinusitis. Um, we've studied and shown that in some people, um, somewhat related to how severely they were blocked, there can actually be an improvement in their sense of smell. Again, everybody? No, some. It can diminish the frequency of headaches. We see patients who look breathe better through their nose and their headache issues resolve. Can I promise that to people? No, my job when I see something that is where there's an uneven space is to correct the space. And what I, what our objective is to open up the breathing through the nose. Will that correct headaches? Well, to whatever extent the headaches are related to not breathing well, well through the nose, sure. But if their headaches are related to other issues, not so. I see people who come in and they think that their septum is going to improve post-nasal drainage or drip. Not so. 
that's often related to the mucous membrane that lines our nose and how well that works and how much mucus it does or doesn't make and whether it makes mucus that's thin or whether it makes mucus that's thick. But the mucous membrane on the inside of the nose isn't swapped out. We don't change the position. We don't change, sorry, the, the native structure of the mucous membrane. So we don't tout this as something that's going to affect post-nasal drip or drainage. It's an operation to make people breathe. How do we diagnose it? Um, uh, the most part, physical exam. Um, anterior rhinoscopy, which is using a speculum, as you see in the picture here, to look inside the nose. Uh, I always complement that with decongesting or numbing up the nose and passing a thin telescope through the nose, otherwise known, otherwise known as nasal endoscopy, to see those parts of the nose that are further back that I talked about earlier, because even if the septum is deviated, I don't want to assume that there isn't stuff going on further back in the nose that also merits attention. Plus, I get a better sense of what the overall configuration of the lay of the land is further back in the nose. Uh, scans, MRIs, CTs, plain x-rays, not necessary. We do those sometimes in um, as a complement to our exam or because we're looking for other things that might also be relevant. So certainly there's times where we're ordering scans on patients with polyps or sinus concerns or where we're exploring other uh, issues or making sure that we uh, don't overlook something, but they're not routinely necessary. So how can it be treated? Um, uh, there are uh, options that don't require an operation. Um, uh, there's uh, One can use nasal sprays that will effectively function to decongest the nose. Uh, the most common of those are the nasal steroid sprays, such things as Flonase or Nasacort that are available over the counter. Um, there's some naturopathic sprays that are based on uh, herbal ingredients that can function as safe long-term decongestants for the nose, and obviously optimizing allergy control. All those things are going to be best beneficial. And certainly in the person with the milder shift of the septum, that might make them very comfortable, in which case they didn't need an operation. Um, I do want to mention that there's a lot of over-the-counter nasal decongestant sprays um, that contain such things as oxymetazoline or pseudoephedrine that are not safe for daily use. So the nasal steroid sprays are safe for daily and long-term use, but most of the over-the-counter nasal sprays, um, we counsel people against daily use. And then there's uh, things that treat the outside of the nose um, or inside of the nose in the way of nasal dilators, such things as breathe right strips that some people are familiar with. They will dilate from the outside in, but there's also internal dilators that are commercially available to try and open up the nose and certainly are effective for, um, for use overnight. As far as the surgical side, um, there's, for the most part, there's two options. Um, it's either a septoplasty, which it would be done to correct a more routinely deviated septum, uh, oftentimes done with reductions in the size of the turbinates that I mentioned earlier. Um, but for those that are more complex or extreme deviations of the septum, uh, they may need what's called a functional, in other words, non-cosmetic septorhinoplasty. And that's essentially a septorhinoplasty that's done to address either a severely deviated septum where it just needs a more comprehensive exposure and correction, uh, or where we're addressing the an, a septal deviation in addition to changes to the framework of the outside of the nose. So the picture we you see down here, this is just a very badly deviated septum towards the front of the nose. And this is not the kind of deviation, it's extreme, that would be amenable to a routine septoplasty. And then you get ones like this, where there's this little bit of buckling of the sidewall of the nose that you see on either side here, where correcting that in addition to what's being done to the septum on the inside is going to adjust the internal framework and the external framework at the same time to try and optimize breathing. So that's going to require a more comprehensive operation, and that's what we call a functional septorhinoplasty. Um, in general terms, if we're looking again at the side view of the nose, if we think of everything behind the plane of the face, so behind this arrow, everything back here, to a large extent, is expendable. And to whatever extent a shift or deviation happens in the septum back here, it can be removed to allow everything else to straighten up um, with, without affecting the outside of the nose in any way. But if we think of the septum as it lies in front of this arrow, in front of the facial plane, 
then it's uh, it can't necessarily be corrected with a routine septoplasty. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. It really depends on the severity of the twist or rotation within the septum in this area of the nose, because this area of the nose, unlike the part of the nose at the back, this part of the septum here provides support to the bridge and tip of the nose. And so yeah, a particularly severe deviation puts the support to the bridge and tip of the nose at risk. And that has to need, be, needs to be corrected in a more comprehensive way. If it's just up here and it's a simple tilt to the septum, it can be done with a routine septoplasty. Essentially what I'm getting at is there really isn't a one size fits all operation, whether it's a one, whether it's a septoplasty, there's many different septoplasties to correct the inside of the nose. Again, depending on what things look like on the inside of the nose, it should be individualized. It should be tapered. We can't apply the same septoplasty operation to all patients with a deviated septum. And same goes for those where we needed to move on to a functional septorhinoplasty. Uh, there's a lot of different configurations that might present where they just need a different fix. And so it really, uh, there, as I said here, there isn't one size fits all, all operation. It needs to be individualized or tapered so that correcting this septum here might be, or this septum here might be very different than collect, correcting this one where the septum is peaking into the left nostril, which is noticeably smaller than the right nostril. But there's also this twist within this central post that separates the nostrils along the base of the nose. So a different, very different operation for that person. The objective of nasal surgery is the same no matter who you are, and that is to establish a normal anatomic nasal airway and to minimize the complications, either a suboptimal outcome, an unhappy patient, or the need for further surgery. And I think that by harnessing the most, uh, the most information that is possible from the preoperative exam and making sound decisions about what the right operation is, to correct a given person's airway, that uh, we can certainly overcome these uh, yeah, issues down here um, as much as is possible. So what does the surgery entail? Um, a septoplasty typically done as an outpatient surgery. It typically takes about an hour to correct the septum, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. We do it in, under a general anesthetic because it's too stimulating to operate on the inside of the nose with an awake patient. Um, there's no external incisions for a septoplasty. Um, deviated portions of the septal bone or cartilage are removed or repositioned to allow what we're preserving to center up into the midline. There's no bruising, there's no swelling, there's no black eyes, there's no discoloration when we're doing a routine septoplasty that's all done through the inside of the nose. We put splints in the inside of the nose at the end of the operation. Those are basically hollow rubber tubes. Um, in days gone by, they used packing. That's not what most people would do today, but I do put a hollow rubber splint on the inside of the nose that basically buttresses or holds the septum for five to seven days and comes out in the office. It's hollow so that people can breathe through it and it doesn't stick out of the nose, so it's not visible. And activity is light. Um, nobody's bedridden. Um, the, um, uh, it really comes down to not doing anything that is too strenuous, um, heavy lifting, um, uh, physical, um, too physical that would promote or prompt uh, further bleeding uh, while the splints are in. Functional septorhinoplasty is a little bit different. It's a more involved operation. It's still being done for the nasal airway, but now we're talking about something that is two to three hours long. It's still under a general anesthetic, and now it does involve an external incision. It's a really small incision that's placed between the nostrils and shaped something like you see here. Um, that incision is probably five to seven millimeters in length total when you think about it. So it's extremely small, uh, and it fades away so that it becomes virtually imperceptible in most circumstances over time. Um, in the functional septorhinoplasty, it's not just about removing cartilage uh, or repositioning cartilage. In this case, because it often involves that portion of cartilage way at the front of the nose, which can't be removed, sometimes it involves reconstructing the septum. In these cases, there is going to be a little bit of bruising or swelling, nothing that's um, uh, terrible. And generally, most of that is gone by the time people are coming back in to get their splints taken out, which is still done five to seven days later. And again, the activity limitations are similar. Um, it's hard to show you what it looks like on the inside of the nose. I chose this patient's um, pictures because 
Um, this is a typical septoplasty done through the inside of the nose because the septum, the septal shift comes through to the bottom of the nose. You're able to appreciate it right here on this before picture here. And you can see the after where we've got, you know, a balanced airway. But under most circumstances, as I said earlier, most of what is seen in a septal shift is on the inside. And in most cases with a routine septoplast, you have to be able to see on the inside of the nose to better fully appreciate the extent of the correction. Um, here's a couple of uh, examples or a few examples I'll show you of the functional septorhinoplasty for the deviated septum. This is the patient I showed you earlier where the septum was poking out to the left and the central segment called the columella or column that separates the two nostrils is twisted as you can see. Oh, pardon me. Um, um, this is the before uh, and this is after. And there is an incision and a little scar here, which again, as I pointed out, it, as I mentioned earlier, becomes very, very imperceptible over time. Uh, this is another patient that I showed earlier um, where there's this buckling of the sidewall of the nose, and that's translated to the position or shape of the cartilage on the inside. And as it buckles inwards towards the septum, even if her septum is straight, she doesn't breathe well until you lift this. And so that cartilage where there was reconstructed or reoriented to provide a little bit of a more stable, well-positioned uh, sidewall to her nose. But really, again, done for a breathing problem. This is another patient that I showed you earlier where I was talking about the extreme shifts that sometimes require a more extensive operation. This is the septum. This is the septum where it hits the bridge of the nose and comes up between those um, upper and lower lateral cartilages that I'd referred to earlier. Um, but there's a shift in the septum as well as collapse of the cartilage. And this is the result after surgery. Uh, this is another patient where, again, this is the the top of the nose, this is the leading edge of the septum we're looking at here. But you can see how there's a twist in this septum. And this septal twist comes all the way up to the bridge of the nose from the inside. So if one was just to work the inside of the nose and open up the airway, we would still have this residual twist on the outside. So a more extensive operation was needed, a functional septorhinoplasty, and that's the after picture that you see there. Uh, a couple of other things we'll touch on and we'll move to questions shortly. Um, do you have to break my nose? Uh, no. Um, if there is a big shift in the bones on the outside of the nose and that would in some way contribute to or have some added value to the airway, then maybe. But as a root, in a routine septoplasty, do you have to break the nose? No. In a functional, septo, septo, functional septorhinoplasty, Sometimes, but only again if the shift in the bones is so severe that it's carrying the septum and everything off to one side. Uh, I know someone who had it and it didn't work. Um, it's a good operation. It works, but there's a number of reasons why somebody might have had it and it, quote, didn't work. Uh, maybe there was other issues that were contributing to the nasal airway problem that went unappreciated. For example, allergy, polyps, those kind of things. Uh, I revise a lot of people where they've had the operation and it might have been a good operation based on the appearance of things at the time of surgery, but in the final and in, in the end turned out to be a little bit underdone or undercorrected or maybe overly conservative. Uh, not a bad thing and no doubt based on decisions that were made at the time of surgery, which seemed appropriate. Um, but sometimes those just don't work out and it needs to be revised and the success rates with revision. And we have done research and published on the success rates of my patients with revision surgery um, was extremely high. I could be that the septum drifted or shifted a little bit as it healed. And we can't control that in a small percentage of people as they're healing over the first few months and things are getting solid again on the inside of the nose. There is the potential for things to drift once they're no longer splinted. It's a small number of patients, but it's not something that we can plan on or anticipate. Um, so it, it is possible. And again, that's still a, a fixable problem. Uh, can cosmetic changes be made to the nose at the same time? Um, yes, they can. Um, oftentimes um, um, they are, or it's not uncommon. Uh, but unlike the medically necessary portion of the procedure, those are not um, things that are uh, covered by insurance. Uh, a few comments about the surgical outcomes and the risks. I would tell you that in general, when this is properly done, the satisfaction rate is extremely high and the complication rate is very low, acceptably very low. 
Um, what kind of risks can there be? Um, diminished or loss of sense of smell, uh, extremely rare, very spurious, unpredictable, uh, extremely uncommon. Uh, if you remember what I said earlier, we also see people a good number of people where their sense of smell improves after the operation, uh, just by virtue of more airflow through the nose. Uh, septal perforation or healing with a hole in the septum, um, pretty uncommon, probably one in every 500 cases. Um, there can be uh, excessive bleeding, again, pretty uncommon. Uh, changes in the external shape of the nose, uh, not something that we typically see with the septoplasty, but because we're working on the structure that provides support to the bridge of the nose, um, it's not impossible. Uh, the likelihood is very low. Um, Again, not typically with the septoplasty. And sometimes if there's changes with a functional septal rhinoplasty, it's because those changes needed to be made to create the airway and change the structure on the outside that we, that we needed to make to, to uh, optimize the nasal airway. Um, all of these are small or infrequent. Um, the big one, and it's not that common still, is this shift or drift of the healing septum. I, mean, I alluded to it a couple of minutes ago. Um, in a small percentage of patients, I tell my patients three to 5% of people, in other words, 95, 97% of people don't need to worry about it, but we don't know who they are. But once the splints come out and the healing in the septum is still getting solid, there is a potential for a little bit of drift. A little bit of drift might be very well tolerated and, and, and not make uh, people symptomatic in any way. But in a small percentage of people, and I would say that it's probably more really like uh, one or 2%, or smaller. Um, there may be a drift that is enough that um, neither the patient nor I are satisfied with the outcome and we need to go back and tweak it or adjust it or revise it uh, to optimize it. And as I said, it's regrettable, but it's not predictable and, it, and it's generally fixable too. So we started out with the outline. We talked. We were going to talk about the possible causes, a little bit about the anatomy um, and, uh, and address the uh, common issues that surround the deviated septum or nasal airway obstruction. Hopefully I've done that for you today. Um, and, uh, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your time. Well, okay. You know, Dr. Gilman, thank you so much. Um, very good presentation, very thorough, because I can tell you that um, as I'm looking at some of the questions that people have submitted, I think you answered a few of these, but um, we should get to these. Um, it, 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 it's an interesting topic, and I think there was a lot of things that, uh, that all of us will come away learning from. So um, what percentage of improvement do you think that people get with some of the sprays? Is it, is it anything measurable, or is there any, any data for that? Or? We don't really have a way to measure that because it's so subjective, right? Um, and so we don't measure it in terms of percentages. Um, Interestingly, even in terms of the nose, in terms of the way the built the nose is built on the inside, um, it's not all space is not created equally in the nose. So you can have a septum that's very deviated low or further back in the nose, and it might not affect you subjectively from a breathing point of view in any way. And you can have a septum that is very slightly deviated towards the front end of the nose, in where the nose gets very narrow, and feel completely obstructed. So not all the real estate is of equal value on the inside of the nose. So we don't really measure percentages. Um, you know, we'll see people where they say, well, yeah, I use the spray and I feel fine. Well, I guess that's 100%. And then we'll see people that say, I use the spray and I you benefit somewhat, but but you can tell that it's just not enough to, to remedy their issues. So it's in the eye of the beholder a little bit. Well, thank you. So review again the post-operative instructions. Sounds like maybe somebody's considering this. <laughs> um, well, the instructions themselves, well, I mean, typically, as I said, there's splints on the inside of the nose for about five to seven days. The nose bleeds or oozes a little bit over the first day and typically just tapers off and stops on its own. Activities light. Um, if I'm doing an external approach, functional septal rhinoplasty, then there's some stitches between the nostrils and a splint on the outside. Uh, if we're just doing the work through the inside, there's a little gauze taped under the nose after the operation. That's the only thing that's visible um, because the nose oozes over the first day. Uh, once the nose is oozing, there's no need to wear a gauze there at all, and there's nothing at all to see. 
Um, I have people rinsing the nose a lot. I mean, if you had a wound anywhere else on your body from an operation, they would talk about wound care and keeping it clean and putting ointment on it. And, you know, these are wounds that you can't get to. They're on the inside of the nose, but it's still a surgical site and it still needs to heal. So I have people rinsing a lot using saline, not spray, but saline rinses a lot. In essence, to rinse, to wash, to cleanse the inside of the nose, it decongests it also. It helps healing. That's the typical routine, post-op care routine. Thank you. And I think you did answer this, but um, someone's asked if, the, if they will lose their sense of smell if they have surgery. Extremely uncommon. Um, extremely uncommon. Um, a complete loss of sense of smell, exquisitely rare. There's no really good numbers. People have said things like one in a million, uh, but I've looked for it and there's no really good number. In other words, it's so rare that it's hard to study. Um, a complete loss of sense of smell diminished sense of smell, not uncommon sort of early post-op while the splints are in, you know, while the splints are in and the nose is stuffy and it's congested and it's swollen, um, people can feel a diminished sense of smell much like you would if you had a cold. Right. And the nose is congested and swollen and stuffy. For all the space that we have in the nose from top to bottom and front to back, the actual space in the nose the actual space in the nose that's involved in our olfaction and our sense of smell is actually very small, very narrow. It's a tight little space at the very top of our nose. It's not the whole nose that's involved in our sense of smell. So because it's in an area in the nose that's very small and very narrow to begin with, a little bit of congestion and one would feel like their sense of smell is diminished. Most of the time, it, loss of sense of smell is uncommon. It's not impossible. Diminished sense of smell is... Um, uncommon, not impossible, um, and improvements in sense of smell happen also. For the most part, people, uh, they're, they're, it doesn't compromise sense of smell. That's very good to know. So what is the significance of a hole in the septum? And, and is that something that really should be fixed? Um, sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Um, you know, if we were comparing to things like loss of sense of smell, we would say it's not that uncommon. Holes in the septum can happen not just from surgery. Um, they can happen as a result of trauma. They can happen as a result of infection. They can happen from certain, you know, sprays or inhalants or drugs that are that have been used in the nose and shouldn't be. Um, there's lots of things that can lead to a perforation in the septum. The septum's pretty large. Under most circumstances, they're a non-issue. Uh, it all depends on how the margins of that hole heal. You know, if they don't heal well, you can have problems with, you know, uh, dryness, uh, bleeding, crusting, uh, you know, around the margins of the perforation. Um, but for, and if they're really tiny, people can feel like the nose whistles as they breathe. Um, and yet many of them are, uh, that we see, which we may see in people who never had a nasal operation as well, or, a person who had an operation 30 years ago, and um, until you put a telescope in their nose, they you, you might not even be able to see it. It's so far back, and they might have had no idea that they have one. So many of them are asymptomatic, too. It really depends on how big, how the margins heal, and where they are in the nose. A lot of those can be left alone or treated conservatively, and I would suggest that the majority of those fall into that category. Thank you. Can I have surgery if I'm on blood thinners? Not a good idea. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the nose is a, has a very rich blood supply. Uh, yeah. Anyone who's ever had a bad enough nosebleed that they had to come into the hospital for it would vouch for that. The nose has a very rich blood supply. Um, you, you know, uh, there's people who are on blood thinners that, that, that bridge. They come off the blood thinner very, for a very short period of time under the guidance or recommendations with recommendations from their physician who monitors that has the operation and resumes their blood thinners within a couple of days of the surgery with splints in place, uh, that's doable. Uh, but if somebody is in a position where they can't stop the blood thinners, chances are they're on the blood thinners for a condition that is uh, more important and more life-threatening than a deviated septum. Oh, that's very good. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, for anyone considering, this is more of a comment, it looks like, for anyone considering sign, uh, septoplasty, I had it a few years ago, and I've been very happy with the results. I had chronic congestion for years from a deviated septum, 
which has noticeably improved uh, since surgery. Thank you for the comment. Um, so if you're a drifter, what prevents one from not drifting with another plasty? Um, it could happen. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, it could happen. Um, I would tell you that, um, uh, so it, nothing's impossible. I think that all the risks that, um, uh, that, that uh, are potentially out there for um, a primary or first time surgery are still there for the revision surgery. Um, the study that we did on outcomes of revision surgery, and again, whenever you're talking about revision surgery, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, um, uh, nasal surgery or your total hip replacement. When you're talking about revision surgery, um, experience matters. I mean, there's people that do a significant amount of volume of revision surgery, and there's people who don't do much at all. So experience matters for sure. Um, in our study that we did on um, revision surgeries, one of the things that we looked at was, you know, where exactly did people fail in the primary surgery? Where did things tend to be residually or persistently bent? You know, we don't know. We don't know if it drifted because I wasn't necessarily there for the first operation. I know that it can happen, but sometimes what we're looking at is areas that just weren't necessarily even well addressed or at the time of the primary operation. But we looked at areas of persistent uh, shift, or in other words, you know, where's the action in the revision septum? Um, that does two things. I mean, one, I think it helped make me a better surgeon when it comes to the primary septum, because if I know where people tend to fail, you tend to have your antenna up a little bit more in certain parts of the nose than, um, than, if, you, than if you didn't know where they typically fail. Um, and, um, and I think that there's also a tendency when you're revising you know, a septum where there's been drift or shift or where people have remained persistently symptomatic to not um, err on the side of conservative. You know, uh, there are times when, um, you know, things are a little bit sort of borderline, you know, should you, shouldn't you, do you take more, do you not, do you manipulate something, do you not? Um, and there's things that would bias us one way or the other. If somebody was, for example, in somebody um, who's 20 years old and athletic and either in circumstances or situations where they might be putting their nose at risk, they're more athletic, they could get bumped, they're in crowds, the likelihood of them breaking their nose is higher. Uh, there's a good argument to be made for being more conservative if you're on the fence. Preserve more structure, preserve more support. On the other hand, when you're in a revision sort of situation, the objective of the, op of the operation is to make sure, as much to whatever extent we can, that that revision operation is the last operation. And so, in that case, you know, I think that things are just done a little bit more comprehensively, and I think there's a certain amount of memory in the septum also that. Um, it doesn't come into play as much once it's been reworked a second time. So we can't, we can't prevent it um, absolutely, but I think the results are, um, uh, are, su are, are surprisingly good. The outcomes are very good in the redos. Thank you. And there was one last question. It was about flow nays. Is that a, an acceptable nasal spray that people? For sure. Yeah, okay. people worry about the word steroid. Um, when they hear nasal steroid sprays, um, it, it makes some people uneasy. Um, but there's a big difference between um, a nasal steroid or a nasal steroid spray and an oral steroid. Um, uh, the nasal steroid spray is the actual systemic availability, the amount of the steroid that gets through the uh, through the nose and into your bloodstream. The amount of your system, other than your nose, that's exposed to the spray is infinitesimally small. So yeah, the nasal steroid sprays are um, have an extremely high safety profile. Years ago, they were all prescription items, and now, you know, you have them over the counter. That's a testament to the fact that um, uh, to the safety profile of those nasal steroid sprays. Thank you. If you would stop sharing your screen for a moment, um, that's the end of the the questions. But I was going to talk to you a little bit about. So um, you and I have talked before, of course. I have a deviated septum and, you know, from a broken nose. Um, so what I remember, uh, Dr. Gilman, is when I, when I did this, I was five years old and I broke my nose, but the pediatrician literally just fixed it right in the, in the, in the exam room. I'm sure that's not recommended today. But, um, but uh, when somebody does have an accident, they actually break their nose. Um, you know, what are, the, what are the appropriate steps 
that they should follow obviously getting attention but what do they what should they expect in terms of the, st the steps to be taken to fix it correctly yeah that's a really good question um uh so you know nasal nasal fractures generally fall into two categories displaced or undisplaced in other words you broke it and it didn't move or you broke it and it moved right um when we reset a nose we're just trying to reestablish the position that it was in before we can't, you know, if you started out, you know, crooked, I have a curve in my nose, a slight one. Um, you have a curve in your nose. Um, if my nose Not was too so white, I know. <laughs> I didn't want to say. Um, <laughs> but if I if my nose isn't centered to begin with and I break it, um, when we reset it, it doesn't somehow miraculously become a centered nose. It it settles into where it was. Okay. If that was centered, great, and either way. But um, about two thirds of nasal fractures don't shift. So if it didn't shift, there's nothing to do. You know, all we do when we reset a we, we reset a broken nose is, you know, put it back to where it was. If it shifted and it didn't move from where it was, doesn't need to have anything done. If you're in the one third that it, you know, where there was movement, I mean, clearly it's still, you know, discretionary. There's people that would say, you know, maybe because of their age and general well-being, okay, it's off a little bit, but I don't want an operation. Uh, understood it's not a life-threatening problem um uh if it's something that should be reset ideally we want to see people early um too often people are told in the emergency department well when the swelling is go down goes down go see your nose and throat well, that is too vague it might be you know people go well the swelling's down i'll go now I'll go see them. it's two months later it's too late to do something. So, you know, it, it's too non-specific just to say when the swelling is down. I tell people I'd like to see them as soon as I can, because that gives me some sense of whether or not that we're going to need to do something or not need to do something. And it allows us to do it on a schedule that is a relaxed one. It doesn't have to be done tomorrow because we're running out of time. We go, okay, you know what? We it's You did this three, four days ago. We're going to do it next week or 10 days from now. We've got time. And, we can, and they can work it into their schedule and I can work it into mine without it being you know, um, uh, you know, a situation critical. Typically, people are told that their noses should be reset within about two weeks. Um, in my experience, you can, uh, I can absolutely reset a nose probably up to three weeks and sometimes four. But if somebody shows up at three weeks minus a day, uh, it's tough. We don't have much working time. So I want to see people as early as possible. They can ice it, um, you know, uh, take decongestants, let a little swelling come down, all that's fine. But ideally, I'd like to see people within four or five days, a week of an injury, and we can make arrangements if something needs to be done to do it in a way that accommodates their everybody's schedule. Excellent. This was very, very good. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll remind everybody on the call that these are recorded. So um, the recording will be done in a few days. Christine sends them out to everybody that's on and anybody that signed up for today's webinar, but they're also available on our website, as well as all of our uh, recorded webinars are on the website. You can you view those at any time. Uh, this may be one you might want to share with some friends, you know, who, um, who have crooked doses like me. So um, thank you, everybody. And Dr. Gilman, thank you so much. Thank you very much.